Hi everybody, it's Phoebe from The Horror Show. And guess what? It's spring, and guess what that means? Time to shop for a new wardrobe! And guess where we're headed? That's right, Subculture Corsets. We can shop online at subculturecorsets.com or stop in at the store in the Avenues Mall off of 95 in Jacksonville, Florida. When you place your order, tell me you heard about it on The Horror Show with Brian Keene and get 10% off your total order. Whether you do it online or in the store, Make sure you stop in and tell them Phoebe sent you. And don't forget to get something really cute for the new season. Gonna see you soon. No comment. Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f***! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f***! Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show. Brian Keene here with you Thursday night, 7 p.m. hour. Uh, we got a little bit of earth, wind, and fire in honor <laughs> of a returning co-host back in the studio with us once again, Phoebe. Hello! This is good music. Welcome back, Phoebe. <laughs> Thank and, uh, you. Of course, uh, joining you here. Yes. Uh, like always, Dave and Mary. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hey, we were driving up today, and we saw a guy walking along uh, the highway with a hammer. Yeah, right and, down the road from and, you. And, and, uh, we're Wait, like, what? And we're like, a hammer yeah, right down the road. We're like, you know, we saw a guy walking along the highway with a hammer, and we're like, oh, that's how uh, pretty much every episode of Investigation Discovery starts. <laughs> pretty so, much. Just, yeah. yeah, yeah so, Sledgehammer and a Here's the question, though. Yeah. Was the man naked? No. He had shorts on? He had shorts on. Okay, well, that's yeah. an improvement to some Which, of the people that we pass by. And it's like 35 degrees outside, so, yeah. All right, well, hello to new listeners. If you're just joining us, this is, yes, this uh, sort of chaos is usually what you can expect at the beginning of the show. It's all going to get worse. Uh, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> we thank you for tuning in. The Horror Show is, of course, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network. It's available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms. If you do happen to listen to us on iTunes, uh, please consider stopping by our iTunes page and giving us a review. That would really help us out. Uh, this week, we have a huge show, just a monumental show. And not only because Phoebe is here with us. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> And not only because Dave is out of the hospital, do, 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 do. Uh, and not only because Mike Lombardo has apparently quit our show, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we have Grady Hendrix. We have the one and only paperbacks from hell himself, Grady Hendrix. Uh, he's going to be on in the second half of the show to talk to Mary and guest that's co-host right. Stephen Kozanowski. Oh, that's awesome. Um, before we get to that, though, we do have a lot of news to go over. Uh one news item, I, you know, speaking of investigation discovery, I don't know if you guys, you guys remember November 8th, 2016, a man of stone savagely attacked a quiet law office in rural New Jersey. Mary, you're from New Jersey. Do you remember I, that? I do not. Yeah. Ten, I, that ten, sounds like par for the course. Yeah, no, it was a, a man of stone. Uh, <laughs> ten people were brutally mutilated and murdered. The killer was never caught. And thus, the legend of the Franz Rock monster was born. The Mud Man by Rob Herrera is a fast-paced thriller laced with horror and dark humor. Inspired by Frankenstein, folklore, and media freak shows, The Mud Man explores what it means to be human, the transformative power of grief, and the fine lines between fact and fiction, man and monster. Some fathers will do anything for their daughters, even raise the dead. The Mud Man is born of mud and made... For murder, the Mud Man by Rob Herrera is available in both paperback and digital editions exclusively at Amazon. That's Rob R O B Herrera E R R E R A. 
Um, this week's show is also brought to you. You, you like that was, how that was I, smooth. That was smooth. Yeah, I, like yeah. That. I yeah. made that yeah. ad seem like thinking. a news story. Huh? I was. I was. I'm looking at Mary yeah. thinking. I, I, I get it. I'm that a, was good. That I'm like, sounds like a good. I'm a crafty motherfucker. Take note. Sleep mattress and, and stamps.com. <laughs> Papa I, socks and Casper bed. I can do this to your ads as well. Um, smooth like butter. Do you remember when Hannibal Lecter ate that man on top of a sleep number bed? <laughs> Well, yes, yes, I do. Do you remember in Hellraiser when that uh, those drops of blood ended up on that sleep number bed? You remember uh, the story of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? How at the end of that novel, the creature escapes alive, floating on a sleep number bed into the wilds <laughs> of the Arctic? Well, it's unnatural. Long life continued for another 200 years. And our story starts now, in 2018, when the monster is still alive. It saw its dreaded enemy, Victor Frankenstein, die, but there is one descendant still living, a woman this time, a scientist in Montana, and the monster has begun its journey toward her to finish its blood feud with the Frankenstein line. But that woman has her own story. Her name's Dr. Josephine Baker, and she is the world's greatest expert in nanotechnology. She's also the mother of a teenage son, a boy who was recently killed by a member of the Chicago police. Josephine is a lot like her great old Uncle Victor. She, too, has decided to defy the rules that divide the living and the dead. Using nanotechnology, she brings her murdered son back to life. But she and the boy don't realize the original creation is almost at their doorstep. What will happen when all three come face to face? Victor Laval's Destroyer is a mind-bending blend of horror and science fiction, combining Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with concerns ripped straight from current events, the Onions AV Club describes it as thrilling, tragic, and topical. It is available now as a trade paperback from Boom Studios. So we thank Victor Laval and Destroyer, and we thank Rob Herrera and the Mudman both for sponsoring this week's show. Uh, two Frankenstein-based mm. interpretations. I like that. I find that intriguing. Maybe Frankenstein is the next zombies. Maybe. Maybe. You know what I kind of wonder, too? Just as an aside, <clears throat> I wonder if the fact that Victor named the character Josephine Baker is significant because wasn't she like a jazz singer? She's a very prominent person in African American history. Hmm. I, Interesting. I would. I would think so. Yeah. That's See, all this, I have. Really. This is why I like having smart people on the show because <laughs> yeah. that would. I, I've, I've, I've read Destroyer. You didn't notice I that? loved it. Oh. It never occurred to me. Oh, when you read it the first ad, I was like, oh wow. Yeah. Victor Laval's a smart guy. He is a smart well, guy. Well, he, he's he way too smart for the show, and yet he wants to come on. And I he want to meet him. I and love he sponsors him. <laughs> of course, you know, girl. Jack Haringa technically is too smart for the show as, as well. But, you know, but Jack had likes him, us. Our lowest rated episode ever, but yes. we, we had him on. Actually, oh. that, that's not true anymore. Oh, uh -huh. who is the new lowest rated episode? The lowest rated episode, actually, the last time I looked, because I haven't looked lately, again, and th this frustrates me because, and this is like technical. They switched the way that they that the, the, they do the uh, the statistics, so I have to kind of like do math to add them together because the old system and the new system don't work together. Mm -hmm. But according to my calculations last time, Stephen Kosnowski <laughs> is the lowest rated episode. Wait, was, which which oh, Stephen Kosnowski? The first appearance, his very first. Yes, appearance. Well, that right. was when nobody knew who he was. So like now. But he's been on the show since, so like... That's because uh, he didn't have the L His hematophages uh, appearance. Yeah, yeah, it's still, it's Kosniewski. Yeah. But you know what? He'll work to bring that up. Don't yes, he will. It. Yes, he I will. Know, it's, it's him and... Um, the power of the L. The, uh, the, uh, Drew Williams. Drew Williams? Yes. Oh, he wants to be a guest during the telethon. If he's not bringing us ratings now, Drew, I'm sorry, we, we can't have you. <laughs> well, <laughs> Drew could just bring a bag of... I, I think guests should bring bags of money with them. Is that what it is? That okay? Yeah. If he right. brings a bag of money with him, sure. Well, yeah. speaking speaking of bags, agree. speaking of bags of money, yeah. Uh, of course, you were not here last no, week. I was you were not. you were in the hospital. Yeah, I'm, I I was in the hospital, and now you need another bag of money to well, pay for all that. I, well, let's let's talk about this because uh, you, as you guys know, after four years of the show, I am rarely serious on this show. I like to have a good time. I like to have fun. Uh, I'm going to be serious right now. Um, I've talked before about my health. We all know I have a shit heart that I was born with. I have many other problems. Most of my innards do not work correctly. I joke about it, but it's the truth. I have taken, uh, last year, 
at one point I was taking 22 different de- diff- 22 different medications a day just to stay upright. Jeez. Um, so the other night, <laughs> uh, what what the, I'm going to make sure I get, I get the day right here because it's Friday night it was it was a morning. Saturday it was uh, the this oh it was yeah, uh, the sixteenth yeah well into the seventeenth it was it was two thirty a.m. Uh, approximately two thirty a.m. on the seventeenth of March uh, yeah St. Patrick's Saint Day, Patrick's day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had a migraine. Which I've talked about on the show. I have migraines. I suffer from my joker like saying, oh, I'll say, oh, yeah, I knew about my migraine medication is a joke. But I really do have migraines. And they're awful. And if you don't have a migraine, if you've never had one, you do not understand how bad they can be. That's all I'm going to say. You just you don't get how much painful these are. So I had a migraine, so I go downstairs to get my medication. When I went downstairs, I got a glass of water, and I sat down on the couch. And then for the next 20 minutes, I had to try and figure out and this is just my brain was not working correctly, that I need to go back to the living room to get my medication. Okay? The next thing I remember is an MRI machine. Yikes. 13 hours later. Wow. Now, what's that like to wake up in an MRI machine? Well, see, this is the thing. I knew what the MRI machine was because I'd been in one before. So I'm like, oh, I know what this is. Because basically what I was in was like in a fog for 13 hours, like... I was kind of conscious, but not really. I, all I can describe it as is like I was occasionally aware that things were going on, but I don't know really what was going on. At one point, I remember being put into a wheelchair, and I'm like, I don't understand this. And occasionally, I heard voices, and all I wanted to do was sleep. So I was just like, voices, leave me alone. So it was like being half asleep. It was. It was. I, that's all I can describe. Apparently, according to Phoebe who had to put up with this bullshit. What happened was, later we figured this out, my blood pressure shot up to near death levels. Like, it should have killed me. Wow. And um, it made me incoherent, and I was babbling and um, showing signs of d- dementia, or I don't know how to describe it. Uh, and, um, you know, they would, like, tell me to raise my hand, and I'd raise my leg, or, you know, just, just weird shit. Nothing was working right. Wow. And um, I was completely out of it. I have no memory of this. Apparently, I was screaming from the pain, from the migraine, which I have done before. I have been to the ER by my house on more than one occasion. Few- well, more than that, just once with you. But, you know, a, a, in the past, I've been to the ER probably four or five times in my life for, for pain from migraines. And they usually give me shots of stuff and send me on my merry way. Um, she had taken me about four years ago uh, for the worst experience I'd ever had with pain. With to at that point, uh, made, this probably was worse. I have absolutely no was. memory of this whatsoever. I don't remember any pain. Like I said, I I remember going downstairs and being very confused. And the next thing I remember is is the MRI machine and like oh. You know, it was just like, oh, okay, I'm getting an MRI. They apparently gave me a CAT scan. I have no memory of that, whatever, no, sir. They gave me all sorts of tests. They pumped me with all sorts of drugs, you know. Like, I was asking her later, like, did I have clothes on? You know, because I don't wear, you know, I like pajamas on. I I don't know, you know. Like, apparently she got me dressed. I don't remember this. I don't remember going to the ER. I remember none of this. Which is a blessing. I guess. I I, You know, I have no memory of this. And I guess I was really obnoxious to the nurses, and I apologize to all of them because I have no memory of this at all. So, like I said, the the basic thing was is that my blood pressure shot up super sky high, and this lasted for about a day, and they got it under control. Um... And as I, I've not talked about this on the show, and I, I only a couple people know about this. But to understand my background uh, on this and in my this my past year with my health, um, you remember if you guys remember I, I talked about earlier this year I went to Germany I went to Oktoberfest, and before I went to Oktoberfest my doctor prescribed me a bunch of new medication. Well, I went to Oktoberfest, and the first night I was there, 3 o'clock in the morning, I passed out in the bathroom and hit my head on the toilet. And the reason why is because I was taking too much medication, and it was new medication. So I, I got really, really sick when I was in Europe. And that started my doctor changing my medication approximately eight times in six months. Now, for those who take a lot of medication, like I said, at one point I was taking 22 different medications. This fucks you over hardcore. 
Um, and the doctors typically don't listen to you when you tell them things. Like, I kept telling the doctor I was dizzy. <laughs> You'd think that would be something You'd they'd, want to, they'd want to pay attention to. they'd want to pay attention to. No. Because uh, th- I literally go to the doctor at one point, and they say to me, Wow, I'm amazed you can stand up. <laughs> That's what you want to hear. Uh, uh, t- 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 <laughs> you think that that phrase was going to be followed? Maybe we should fix this? Right. They send me on my merry way. I go out to the parking lot to go to my car. I experienced what I called a gray out, where my vision went gray, and I saw nothing but the slightest shapes before my eyes. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. 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 Yikes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, basically, between October and January, I passed out several times, usually in my own home. Uh, twice in the morning, when Phoebe was home, I fell down the stairs. Uh, and then the one day I, I got up and was going to go to the the couch and then fell down again. And um, mm-hmm. it, this was just an ongoing thing. And it was just because all my medic- I was having really bad reactions also to medication. And the other thing to know about me, and again, this is something that, that Brian and Mary know and my friend Della know and, and obviously Phoebe knows. I have shit kidneys. Well, I'm more optimistic. Well, we don't know anything you, uh, for you, sure. You do know because we, just let me talk. I'm being honest today. My kidney function is about 60-70% of what a normal human's kidney function is. Now, they, they, they seem to think that they can keep it at this level, but who knows? I was told many years ago by a doctor, hey, I eventually need a kidney transplant, which, again, is not exactly how you present this to someone right <laughs> where you just like kind of blurt it out like, like an, it's like interesting bedside yeah, matter yeah, that your yeah. doctor has. Uh, you know it's like we eh. made you a cake yeah also you need yeah. a kidney yeah. transplant it's like, right. It's, like, right. It's, it's like a it's like it's just a it's not a big deal you know it's just, just a kid, <laughs> it's, it's just a it's kidney it's a fun you know? activity for the afternoon you know <laughs> it's like yeah so who knows but so i have that to worry about and so this so, you know, I'm on all new, not new medication, but a new set of medication, um, which s- somebody in the chain has already fucked up one because they, they lost the medication. CVS. Well, we don't know for sure, but that, CVS. that's my guess. CVS <laughs> yeah. won't be sponsoring this. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Hey, folks, are you tired of pharmacists who give you your medication on time? <laughs> Go to Rite Aid. <laughs> yeah. I, I I, and here's the thing. Um, I am very fortunate to have medical insurance because I live in the state of Maryland, which is not Russia, unlike Pennsylvania and many other states in America. And, you know, our government is actively trying to get rid of med- medical insurance for people like me who are constantly sick and ill. Um, so, you know, I'm very lucky because otherwise I'd probably have you know, a quarter million dollar hospital bill right now. Because I was in the hospital for how many days? Four? Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Wait, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, you were in for four days. Yeah. What's yeah. what's the total for something like that? Um, we haven't seen the bill yet. We haven't seen the bill yet. Guesstimate. I'm, I'm going to couple hundred guess, thousand, maybe. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to guess about between one hundred and two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Keep in mind, I don't have health yeah. insurance, so I pay cash when it's right. something little, like yeah. there's blood when I pee. Yeah. yeah. But if I had something happen like you, or God forbid, I had another heart attack or cancer, that that's it for me. I'm done. Well, I said before. They don't have you know, I talked to you guys about this. And I think people should know this to understand the the terror that someone like me lives under constantly. And it is terror. My kidneys. Say my kidneys get totally fucked up and I need dialysis. Dialysis out of pocket costs for a year is a quarter million dollars. Now we better work on getting sleep sleep number mattress. This TV. is yeah. this is not a joke. Yeah. I don't have I mean, a quarter of a million dollars laying around. Not the average person does not have a quarter of a million dollars laying around. They don't have close to a quarter of a million dollars laying around. So you you get sick like this, you have two choices: die, <laughs> you know, or like in my case, I'm fortunate enough to own a house, so I could sell my house to pay for a year of dialysis and then die, you know. Or kill myself so at least Phoebe has a house to live in. This, these are my choices if I get desperately ill in this country. So you people wonder why I yell about health insurance. This might be why. But anyway, so I'm you know again I'm very fortunate to 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 be alive. I'm very fortunate that Phoebe was home because I said to her if she had not been home when this happened I don't know what would have happened. 
I really don't know because I was out of my mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's, I have it was obviously there was no way I was operating a vehicle to drive myself to the hospital. You I knew have been able to I knew at when this started that something was wrong with me, but I couldn't articulate it. <laughs> so, like I said, I knew when I was downstairs, I couldn't figure out that I had to walk from the, the kitchen to the living room, which I said took me 20 minutes to figure out to do this, to get my medicine. I knew there was something wrong with me, but I didn't know how to, to, to say this. And I don't know why I went back upstairs. I guess to maybe in the back of my head to find her. I don't mm-hmm. know. After that, I have no memory until the MRI machine. And like I said, I didn't freak out about that because I think I kind of at that point figured out I was in the hospital, but I wasn't sure. But I was like, oh, okay. An MRI machine, like, if you've ever been in one, it's, like, super loud. It's like, yeah. bomb, 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 bomb. But, but you, it's instantly recognizable. It's kind of like being a shoe in the dryer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. That's what it sounds like. Description. But if you've ever done it, you know exactly what it is, like, the second you've, you've experienced it. Well, we're, we're glad you're back. Well, man. yeah, we're, so... We're glad you're home. I, I do... I, I have something now I got to want to say. I'm sorry. I want to say this. Um, so, people have been asking me, how can we help? I am not a charity person. I feel very, very uncomfortable when people give me things. <laughs> so, but there are things you could do, you know, in this situation. If you want... If, you, if there's something you want to do to help me, you can. Because I'm going to be getting now what I call unexpected bills <laughs> uh, yeah because there's always things that are not covered yeah and it's going to add up to a lot so there are things you could do a and brian already mentioned this if you listen to this show please go leave us a five-star review on itunes please you have no idea how much this will help us which, and, for everybody and to do that uh if you want to run an ad on the show i would greatly appreciate it uh please watch my twitch channel <laughs> it'll be back soon we yeah promise. it'll be back I've, I've obviously not been doing it but i'll be back soon i'm trying to get partnered I need to get 75 people average in a month to do that. The more of you who watch it, the better. And you can do what my ex-wife does. She has a tab on her browser that she just leaves open to the channel. So whenever it comes on, she can watch it. <laughs> so nice. You, you or not watch it. It, or just not, it just runs. So exactly. And um, Wait, so I can... I can open your Twitch channel yeah. in a web browser mm-hmm. and leave it. And like, go have sex with Mary. Mm-hmm. And it still counts as a view. Yeah. For you. yeah. Well, shit, baby. Why aren't we doing that? I don't know. Yeah. Well, he hasn't been on lately, so save that for your next romantic interlude. <laughs> well, and then we can hear you cursing we could, about things. We could, have sex, we could have sex on your Twitch channel. No, you can't. I'm, I, I think yeah. there's a rule about that. Yeah, yeah in no, fact, I know ew. there's a rule because they just changed all the rules. I'm, it's a nudity I'm, thing, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> and don't say you can do it with clothing because it's still not going to make it right. Yeah, that's, that's we could. No. We could. I'm sure we're you can, ingenious. but we don't want to see this. We're pretty creative. No, no, no. Good. It's a private thing. Did, uh, again, they have whole, there's a whole you porn thing you guys could just could take can over. We, can we make money off of that? I don't know. I, you might be able to. Ain't nobody paying money to see my pasty white middle aged ass. <laughs> yeah, guys are screaming, gyrating, making money on the porn channel. All right. Anyway, well, so but so the, so so there's that. The other thing is is again I mentioned this before. If you have Amazon Prime, which 150 million people do in the United States apparently, uh, there's a thing called Twitch Prime. That is a free Twitch subscription you can get. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that if using a channel. Again, these are things you can do that cost no money. Yep. You know, it costs you no money to do that, uh, to use that on my channel. And it, I get the money from that. Um, and again, you can subscribe to my channel if you want to. Um, you know, and also, when we, when the, by the time you hear this, I'm going to have a setup on my channel that you can leave me tips uh, through PayPal, which, you know, it's because people have asked me, can I just if give you some money? you entertaining. Yeah, but I know. I, yeah. I just don't want people... To, somebody was like, do you want to set up a GoFundMe? I'm like, no, because first of all, I'm saving that for a complete disaster medical thing, which could happen any time. Some other organ mm. inside my body could explode. <laughs> so, but um, but anyway, if, if you want to help, there's a ways you can help and, and listen to our show here, yeah. uh, which you're obviously doing right now. And uh, thank you, everybody, for reaching out to me on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram and being so nice you know, when I was Aww. in the hospital. It, it is, no, it's really appreciated. Uh, being in the hospital is as boring as fuck. There, yes. There is absolutely yes, is. nothing to do. And You should have listened to the show. I've well, turned the nurses on to it. I, I here's the thing. I, I hear this show. I, I record it. I, I don't listen to the show after I like edit it. <laughs> you it's should like, have listened <laughs> to uh, Necrocasticon. I, I, 
I don't know. You should listen to Three Guys at Beards. I, I, I was already in the hospital. I didn't need to be <laughs> like the, the You mental. should have listened to Ink Stage. That would have been relaxing, good for the blood healing. pressure. It would have been very healing. That would have been just healing. Well, there was a... There was a listening. I, I should have probably played that for that nurse that was yelling at me. Um, the, the the one that was... At least she had, you know, big boobs or something. But so that... <laughs> But other than that, you know. Why were you looking at her boobs? Don't look at big boobs. They get in trouble. I, I, I look at yours. You're telling him, don't yeah. look at big boobs? Yeah. I know, pot kettle. What can I yeah. say? <laughs> pot kettle. <laughs> anyway, I'm, let's divert well, from yeah, my boobs. Yes, Wel- welcome home, Dave yeah. and, and Phoebe. Welcome yeah. back to you. Yeah, it's been um, a long time. You know, speaking of helping people, a couple, couple things I want to go over before we get to the news. Um, Dave, you missed this. You weren't here. Camelot Books uh, have partnered with us. Um, they're raising money for Scares the Care. Uh, basically, what they're doing, they're offering two signed Edward Lee hardcovers for the price of one. Two signed Edward Lee hardcovers, $50, um, and $20 from every set sold goes to Scares the Care. They have a $2,000 donation. So you That's know, amazing. They want to they give two grand. The scares that care. Uh, the way to do that is just go to CamelotBooks.com, and you'll see it there. You'll even see they have the little goal thermometer and, oh, nice. and buy your set. Um, something else I want to remind folks about: the second annual horror show with Brian Keene, Scares that Ter- Scares that Care Telethon, is coming up. That's going to take place May 11th and 12th, noon to noon. Uh, we will be streaming it live on the internet. You can also be there in person. It takes place at the Courtyard Marriott in York, Pennsylvania. Tickets are only $25 to be there in person. You can purchase those by going to the horror show at BrianKeen.com and clicking the link at the top of the page. Everybody will be there. Phoebe will be there. Uh Dave and Mary will be there. I'll be there. Coop will be there. Lombardo will be there for Wheel of Lombardo. You know, by the way. That little fucker. Yeah. Uh, Fuck him. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if he's going to be there. You know what? We should, we should fucking call him. Yeah, we should. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I, I don't, is he making pizzas this time of day? <laughs> All right, so I'm calling Lombardo right now. Let's get to the bottom of this. Okay. Hello, Mike Lombardo speaking. How may I help you? Hey, Mike, <laughs> be- before you say anything else, uh, you're live on the air with me and Dave and, and Mary and Phoebe. Hi Mike. Hi. So we were we were just talking here about you know all the the success you're continuing to have as 2018 oh. rolls right around, and uh, we were talking about your recent appearance on another podcast. And oh, uh, well, we actually we hadn't talked about that yet. We were going to bring it up, and then I got so angry at you, I thought we'd just call you live on the what what the fuck you're co-hosting another podcast. Look, you guys will always be my main piece. Don't get me wrong. You know, you know, it's you're the last thing I think about before I fall asleep, and the first thing I think about when I wake up. But Aww. the horror show, I mean, it's no horror syndicate. All right? Wow! Wow! You know, a younger, you're do, leaving us for I, a younger podcast. Yes. I'm not trading you in for a younger model. Don't get me wrong. You know. <laughs> I mean, you know, those three guys are pretty studly and all that, but the thing is, they can see my face on that podcast. You know, it's a Skype thing, so, you know, all people can do is hear my voice on this one, and, you know, it's 2018. As you guys know, I'm kind of a big deal now. This <laughs> is my moneymaker. You know, I mean, I'll always have time for you guys. Don't worry. You know, and honestly, it's my neck starting to hurt from looking down on you so much, so... It's, 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 you do realize, wait a minute, let me just interrupt here. You do realize we're in the midst of planning Wheel of Lombardo, if you can still make the telethon. Oh, I'll, you know, I'll have my people talk to your people. <laughs> I think I might be able to do it. All right, was, uh, all right listen, listen, thing, right? listen, we, we have important things. We have Grady Hendrix to get to, um, but, but because I love you, uh, and because you will see me on the way back down, like you saw me on the way up, why don't you go ahead and plug uh, the Har <laughs> plug the Har Syndicate? Let's let's give them a plug on the show. Uh, well, the Har Syndicate is run by Ray Merrick, Brian Enright, and Jared Letourneau. It's a very cool horror news site, and uh, every Friday they do a live podcast called The Horror Syndicate Lives, which goes live on Facebook Live around nine o'clock. And I'm now a co-host of that, so you guys will be able to see me on there. And then you know, wish I was in your studio. But All right. 
Oh. You know? All right. Well, uh, you you get going. I know you have to go to work, and by go to work, I don't mean make movies. I mean go to the pizza shop. So you head out to work. Yeah. You know, way to way to pop my balloon, Brian. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real for you. Well, you know, I gotta, I gotta be, you know, kept in line. I mm. love all of you guys, and I'm very excited to be on another episode of the horror, the, the horror, the horror show. Is that what's called? <laughs> love you too. Talk to you later. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. So there yeah. you have it, yeah. Mike Lombardo. So he's basically on a show that's like three guys with beers with less listeners. Is what he said. <laughs> Facebook Live, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Yeah. All right. So there he is, Michael uh, Mike Lombardo. I, I'm, He's like a little big for his britches. Isn't I, he? I love that little fucker. I'm proud of him. I know. think that, uh, I, you know, if you're going to be on the show, you're going to have to sign a loyalty oath. No, look, look, look. A non compete I'm happy for him, and, I, you know, I well, am. That, oh, let's face it, Facebook Live is not competing with look, us. Let's put it down. I'm. I'm a fan of the horror syndicate. I like what those guys do. They're nice guys. Uh, you, at least he didn't like go to Kevin Strange's podcast or something like that. Who? <laughs> Does he still have a podcast? Who? Who? <laughs> That's Jay's answer to Who? that. Who? <laughs> hey, you know, speaking of speaking of that person, you know who we're gonna have back on the show this year? Oh yeah, I do know. Uh, John Bruni. Yeah. Oh. Whose so first nice. appearance on the show, unfortunately, he had to appear alongside right. Kevin Strange. Yeah. Um, John will be back solo nice. uh, next month, I believe, yep. actually. Oh, next really? Um, so maybe, maybe we'll talk to him about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's get to the news, and then we got to get to Grady Hendrix. Um, the news. Last week, Mary, yes. you and I talked about David J. Scowl's new collection, uh, which is out now from Subterranean Press mm-hmm. in hardcover and ebook. Um, it's called DJ Stories. It's stylized DJS Tories. Mm-hmm. Uh, DJ, DJ Stories. You remember I wondered if I was pronouncing it right. right. Well, David got in touch with me to tell me, yes, I was pronouncing it right. Nice. Um, you know, it's uh, it's 30 stories. It's it's his best of. It's his greatest hits. His greatest hits. Okay, well, he, he got in touch to, to share a little bit of information. Okay. Um, because he was so impressed with our coverage, because apparently we're the the only horror news outlet that actually bothered to report on this. <laughs> um, the original ARC, you know, advanced reading copy that they send out to reviewers and such right. was 600 pages. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Um, now what Subterranean Press did, they increased the trim size, so the final book tops out at like 520 pages. Okay, but what that means is the advanced reading copy is now an item of rare value. Right. Uh, right. I do not have an advanced reading copy. I would just point that out to you, Bill Schaefer at Subterranean Press, (laughs) and you, David. How dare you? Um, Just laying it out there. So if one if one lucky listener out there wants to hook me up with a, an advanced reading copy of DJ Stories, that'd be awesome. Uh, David also had this to say regarding choosing a book title that will guarantee Google search engine superiority. He says, long after his collection, I, was signed, sealed, delivered, sold out, and declared out of print, He abruptly remembered that Frank Herbert had used the same title for a collection of his short stories. (laughs) Thirteen in all, just like David's book, but it was published in 1985. He says, I hate it when that happens. Too many books, films, and stories already have the same title these days. So often, it seems, that we have simply run out of good titles, a situation I always sought to to redress, except that he didn't. Um, Let's take a look at some of his other book titles. (laughs) Seeing Red was also the title of a 1984 Roger Omerud novel and has been repurposed <laughs> a staggering amount of time since 1990. Lost Angels? Mm-hmm. Even worse. It was also the title of a 1989 Hugh Hudson film. Black Leather Required? Yep. Bingo. Google superiority <laughs> at last, right? No. Well, you'd have to parse through all the bondage sites, but yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say. Crypt Orchids? Not bad if you could get past all the spay and neuter veterinary clinics advertising. Really? <laughs> yep. Um, you know, and of course, coming back to I, a fall from titular grace he had not suspected, even though he tried to make some of the contents deeply relevant to the title. David says, after that, the concept of Google superiority came foremost in the consideration of any book title. 
Zombie Jam, Havoc Swims Jaded, Internecine, Upgunned, A Little Aqua Book of Creature Tales, DJ Sturbia, and of course, <laughs> DJ Stories. Uh, he says, all new authors out there listening, take this advice from the Grandmaster of Splatterpunks. Your title must place first or close in a Google search. And David J. Scow recommends the, this discipline unhesitatingly. Nice. End of quote. So, That's good. That's true. Little little wisdom there from the master. Um, Although you're still going to use Mary kills people for something, I don't care. <laughs> I may. I yeah, may. You must use that. A collection of hitchhiker fiction. Yes. <laughs> All right. Other news. Um, if if any of our listeners read my end of the road columns, which were published on Cemetery Dance's website, yeah, and uh, are actually going to be collected and published in hardcover by Cemetery Dance next month. Uh, the book will also be called End of the Road, and it will f completely fail at Google superiority. <laughs> um, I don't, you'd be surprised how often your stuff comes up at the top anyway. Really? Yeah. Well, that's because I'm on top, baby. I'm, oh, I'm a top. Uh, that's where I like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll, remember, you'll remember in End of the Road. I, I, Phoebe suddenly remembers why she doesn't come to the show anymore. <laughs> well, I, had Mary and I been here a couple weeks ago? Oh you know? right! A whole the, discussion went with happened. the swinging balls situation there. It, oh, it would have still happened. We would, I would said Google it. Just Google it. <laughs> we don't need to discuss it. <laughs> WebMD. <laughs> the low hanging fruit. Well, no, 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 no. You never look at WebMD. WebMD, oh, WebMD no matter what you look up, convince you that you have, is, is yeah. you're going to die. Yeah, you're like that you're dying. I got a paper cut. Well, time to chop your arm off. You yes, know, this is, this it, it, a paper cut could be a symptom of you of, know of, Ebola, of, of brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're not talking about his balls again, right? No, no, okay. we can if we you want me to. No. <laughs> well, in end of the road, when I wrote that column on my balls. <laughs> That's the special that's chat fault. book. Is, is, is that a, is that a special that. limited edition? How does that work? No, in End of the Road, I, I did a an essay on, on Burbank, California's Horror Row. Uh, it's a whole stretch. Magnolia Boulevard or Street. Magnolia something. It, it's it's populated by stores like Dark Delicacies, Woo! Blast from the Past, Bearded Ladies Museum, Creature Features, many others. Oh. Um, well, some sad news. Uh, Creatures Features have announced that they are, in fact, leaving Burbank. Uh, they said, quote, our lease is up and the new rent is, shall we say, prohibitive. Mm -hmm. um, they point out to customers that what they're going to do for the moment, temporarily, is they're going to move all of their stock to their Pasadena area warehouse, uh, which I've been told is like something out of Raiders of the Lost Ark or X-Files. Oh. Um, they do plan on still doing public events uh, as they point out they've done events in the past at Arclight Hollywood, El Capitan, the Vista Theater, Disney Studio lot, uh, Rick Baker's makeup effects shop and many other places um, they have you know some events lined up some which will take place on Magnolia so they'll still have a presence there um, and you know they, they they point out this is their 25th anniversary Right. Um, coming up, so you know they're they're not out of business. They're just they're leaving Burbank for the right. time being. Right. Um, so they encourage folks to subscribe to their newsletter. I encourage you to do that as well. Great store. Uh, you know what I like about them? You could get any horror movie soundtrack ever. Oh there. really? Oh yeah. Nice. Like the Blob, Carpenter's oh, The Thing, cool. They Live, um, El Topo. I got the El Topo soundtrack. Oh, there. the shoes. You know. I want to see this movie just to see the shoe. <laughs> That's all I know about we, this movie. We should, we should, we should have a, a show a where screen. we live, we yeah. live screen El Topo. Last year, we did an episode where Dave, myself, Coop, and Lombardo watched the pilot of Fuller House. I feel we should do a repeat where Phoebe, Mary, and Dungeon Master watch El Topo. <laughs> first of all, first of all. Child Protective Services <laughs> is going to come over to your house and take your kid away from you if you make him sit through that crap. I don't know. What, what's yeah. Girlfriend Protective Services yeah. should come and rescue me. I like Girlfriend Protective Services. Yeah. Second of all, Phoebe's going to punch you in the throat if you make her sit through that movie. I think I just to the Valley of the Shoes. We should watch it just to the Valley of the Shoes, which is what, like 20 minutes in or something? Hell, not even that long. Yeah. 
I don't because even know what this point, movie is about. Because by that point, your brain just goes. It's not Ugh. about anything. That's it's just not about it. anything. It's just weirdness for weirdness. It's about sake. everything. It's like if you have a don't a listen fever to these two and you're dreaming heretics and you're on acid all at the same time, and yeah, people like this it's movie. It's about it's about being a man and oh, well, like, uh, and mm-hmm. guilt and redemption. He's making this up. It's no, it's not I'm not. That's what it's about. Where does it say that? I'm going to look at that. <laughs> says it when you watch the movie. Oh. All right. No, no, because for the first 20 minutes, nobody says anything at all. It's just a guy and a naked kid on a horse. Isn't that illegal? With no name. Isn't that illegal? Well, it was the 60s. It's okay. not like he's doing things to the it, horse it, oh, it's or the, the 60s? kid. Well, that's why it's like a... Oh, it's so weird. It's so weird. All right. You know what's not weird? <laughs> it is the rush of cinema. See, I don't even want to go on with the news because now Phoebe has her phone out and she's going down the Alejandro <laughs> Jodorowsky. I just want to read how it's described the first word, El Topo, English, The Mole, is a 1970 Mexican acid western film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God! What? I wish you could see this her is, face. This folks. is radio. You you have okay, to tell wait. people what you read. <laughs> this you is can't just stare at your Characterized phone. by its bizarre characters and occurrences, use of maimed and dwarf performers, and heavy doses of Christian symbolism and Eastern philosophy. Yeah. It is about enlightenment. So, yeah. Oh. See? Oh, but I don't know what I'm talking about. I thought you were just making shit up. I never <laughs> make shit up. Yeah, you do. I always have a plan. <laughs> I never bullshit. I don't want to see this. I don't care. Okay. You know what you do care about? What do I You care? know what you want to read? More Victor Laval. More Victor Laval. Yeah. Uh, you also want to read New Fears, the anthology oh. series edited by Mark Morris. Now, Mary. Yes? You're an author. Thank you. How many <laughs> times a year do we hear our peers saying, you know what they don't make anymore and they should? Non-themed horror anthologies. Dave, you're a reader. How many times a year yes. do you hear other readers complain, you know what they don't make anymore, non-themed horror anthology. Everything has to have a theme now. Okay, so Mark Morris makes y'all a non-themed horror anthology series. New Fears mm-hmm. came out from Titan. Uh, New Fears 2 will be out this September. By the way, disclaimer, I am in the first volume of New Fears. Of course. Because um, you are an author as well. That's right. Um, okay, but Titan have informed Mark that despite the brilliant reviews that New Fears got, uh, it has not yet sold enough copies for them to justify continuing the series. Oh, no. Oh, really? So unless it sells well, you know, it, there's not going to be any more New Fears. Like I said, New Fears 2 will still come out in September. Right. Okay. But, you know, there won't be anything after that. Okay. There certainly won't be a New Fears 3. Um, however... Titan have also told Mark if the books eventually earn out, they will consider commissioning future volumes. So, how do we unfuck this situation? Read the book. Buy the book. Well, buy the books. Well, yes, of course. Well, don't a, read them. Then they well, go don't. to. Then they go to. You know, they pull a Jeff Burke and read the shit for free online. No, Titan needs to see. <laughs> well, I just assumed you would buy the book, not steal it or. <laughs> do something illegal, buy the book and read it. Because Phoebe thinks think well way. of you, audience. <laughs> Am I wrong? And you, and you Jeff Burke. I love to, uh, you know, if, if you don't get the reference, go to the thehardshowedbriankeen.com, click show archives, scroll down to our first year's worth of shows, and listen to the episode with Jeff Burke where he and I debate for 20 minutes the ethics of, of evil piracy. piracy. Yeah, it's actually a very, I think we both made each other really see the other side's viewpoint. I don't know sure. that anything was resolved. Because there's something but, incredibly sexy about pirates except when they're stealing money from I, w- I would be interested for you both to have that discussion again now. Three years later. Yes. I would like to. I, yes. In fact, I was talking to Jeff last week. I was wondering if he was going to be out this way yeah. this year. He's not. Um, however, I think, Mary, there was some discussion from Rose. They really want you at Bizarro Con. So if, if yes, you actually, would... Rose emailed me yesterday after email. Okay, well, there. If you're attending Bizarro Con, I'll, I'll go this year. And while Mary's teaching a workshop, Jeff and I'll go sit in the heated pool with uh, the recording equipment. Oh, and, so nobody uh, wants hopefully. me at Bizarro Con or any other con. Or... Because <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because you won't let me take the recording equipment into the heated pool. You'll holler at me. Well, yeah, I can't imagine why you can't take the recording equipment into a pool. You can take this one, isn't this? No, it's not waterproof. 
<laughs> we need we need did, we did need more advertising you, dollars to get waterproof. Yeah. Yeah. Waterproof. <laughs> look, look, here's what we do. Okay. Then then we'll we'll film all of our things. We get hot Victor heads. Laval to buy a month's worth of ads for the sequel to Destroy. <laughs> And that buys us a, a new portable recorder. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Could it buy us a hot tub? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Our own hot no. Tub. All right. All Seriously, right. Uh, you know, whether you're a writer, whether you're a reader, yeah, you gotta if you book. want the old school, traditional, non themed horror anthology, it's there. All you got to do is buy it. New Fears and New Fears 2, edited by Mark Morris. End of story. And it's Woo! a collection of just really good. Scary yeah, stories. just great fucking horror stories. Right, That's by awesome. different writers. You know, very diverse uh, lineup of writers. Cool. Plus me, you know. Um. <laughs> it sounds awesome. All right, two more news stories. One's good, one's bad. Which one do we want first? Bad. I'm always for bad news yeah. first. Yeah, I like All the right. way you did that last yeah. week. The yeah. the utter destruction of the comic book industry continues. Uh, Diane Nelson whose leadership as president of DC Entertainment and president of Warner Brothers Consumer Products has instituted many of the positive changes yeah, at I the like company her. over the last... You do like her. I do like her. She got you a gig right in Wonder Woman. Right, and she sent me um, a Christmas card, which I thought was And she sent sweet. you a Christmas card. Unfortunately, while she may have been your, been your biggest champion at DC Comics, she's no longer with DC Comics. Um, she is taking... An immediate leave of absence, uh, according to the Hollywood Reporter. Actually, it's not immediate. It starts April second, so it starts two days after the show airs. Right. Um, the leave of absence has no end date. Um, it includes the terminology "spend more time with the family," which, in the cases of most CEOs, means that it's you know it's a it's it's a final leave of absence. Mm -hmm. like the, the person does you not usually come. They're back. not coming back. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was announced in a company email from uh, Warner Brothers head uh, Kevin Tushara, whose name I always mispronounce, which is why DC won't hire me to write any more comic <laughs> books. Um, is that the reason? <laughs> I kind of think well, there might be a few others. There might be a few <laughs> others. Uh, Dan Didio, Jim Lee, uh, will continue to run DC Entertainment. You, you thought I was going to say they were the other reasons, but no, they will continue <laughs> to run DC Entertainment. Um, so yeah, uh, I have no complaints about Diane Nelson. She no, she's she nice. She was very nice to me. She was very nice to you. She she did. She sent us both Christmas cards. Oh. I'm sure even the janitor got a Christmas card. But hey, hey, I'm special, Dan. You know who did not get a Christmas card was Keith Giffen. Oh, who said, and I quote, "How the hell did you two get Christmas cards? <laughs> I didn't get one." Um, so all right, that's the bad news story. Now the good news story. Okay. okay. Wayne Allen Sally. Uh, he is now owned by NBC Universal. <laughs> I didn't think you could buy and sell people anymore in this country. Well, the Wayne, Wayne Allen Sally, he's one of the bright stars of Splatterpunk's second wave. Oh. Um, he is a major, major... And quite a funny man. Majorly okay. influential author on myself, on Jesus, uh, I suspect on Nick Mamatas. Well, that's exciting, on many then, others. right? Uh, yeah, so he, but he is now owned. By NBC Universal, uh, he has made the switch from author to actor, oh, and he is really? a, he is appearing in four episodes of Chicago Med as a transplant patient. Now, I've never watched Chicago Med. Do, no. Phoebe, you like to watch bad television. Do you, have you ever watched I, Chicago Med? No, no. Uh -uh. So it might be good television then. It's a medical drama. Yeah, it's been on for a while. Hasn't That's it? all with the the new guy with the spiky hair. I don't know. Wayne does not have spiky hair. No, no, no. I mean the doctor guy. Is, is, if it's the show I'm thinking of, is and I could cute? be totally... They're always He's not cute. really my type. I no. mean, he's all right looking. Okay. I mean, he's pleasant looking. Okay. Aesthetically pleasing, but he's not really my type. I don't... Good, no, good I save, Sandra. <laughs> I, I don't... I've never seen the show. No? Well, we'll, we'll all have to tune in because... Yeah, uh, we got to support the man. Yeah, like I said, Wayne's going to be in four episodes. Um, now, unfortunately, I know a whole bunch more details, but can't reveal them here on the show, of course, because... Uh, you know, as I said, Wayne is now owned by NBC Universal, and we don't want them suing us or him or right. anybody else. But still, very, very cool break for him. That's awesome. That's uh, really very cool. cool. Yeah. 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 Woohoo! So, congratulations, Wayne, Allen, Sally. Happy news. All right. Let's get to the interview with Grady Hendrix. Before we do that, though, I want to remind folks this week's show is brought to you by The Mud Man by Rob Herrera, which is available in both paperback and Kindle exclusively at Amazon. That's Rob. Like uh, what Armand Rosamilia has to do to keep this network afloat. 
Herrera, E R R E R A. Phoebe, what, what's that face oh for? Oh my god, I'm you're so joking. Mean. <laughs> Ew, holy cow. And of course, Victor Laval, Laval's destroyer. Uh, that's destroyer, like what Dave wants to do to the medical profession. Uh, <laughs> Which is available in trade paperback right now from Boom Studios. Um, so, yeah, let's go to you and Kazanuski with Grady Hendricks. Anything you, we need to know about this interview in advance? No, I think you should just go into it totally surprised. Dave, from a technical aspect, anything we need to know in advance? I don't think so. You don't hear anybody sneezing in the background? Oh, there is a crap ton of noise in the background, but it's, you know, it's... Yeah, the, we, should, we, should, we should mention, I guess, that um, we stole Grady Hendricks in between things. And Kazanuski said, hey, I found us a nice quiet spot to record. And I said, okay. And he led us to some back hallway somewhere, which was okay. <laughs> but you know, it I, was a back hallway. I just, I, I want to... Kazanuski's uh, technical <laughs> prowess is not, not It was a back best. hallway by the bathroom. I want to yeah, reiterate saying. to young Master Kazanuski. Now, Rose O'Keefe and Grady Hendricks were guests who I have been wanting to get on this show. <laughs> And I had pages and pages and pages of questions, insightful, deep questions I would have asked. And Kazanusi just goes and snipes them both when I'm not around. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> Lombardo used to do the same shit, Kazanuski. And if you keep it up, you too will be 30 and still working in a pizza parlor oh. and guest hosting on the horror syndicate yeah. instead of the horror show. That's, that's, oh, my God. We that's tried right. to be deep and insightful. I tried to think of the kind of questions that Brian <laughs> would I think you did Brian a good job ask. with Thank Rosa. You. Mary, I enjoyed well, it very much. I, Thank I, you. I will say, based on just on Rose's interview, that Mary does a good job with these interviews. Yes, she does. Thank yeah. you. What, what yeah. will Thank be the you. number one listener complaint this week? Will it be Dave took too long to tell his, his hospital story, or will it be Brian... Brian's really angry at Mike Lombardo you know, because we don't understand humor. Because here's, 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 here's <laughs> which, which will it be? Here's yeah. Dave's thought on that. Fuck you. <laughs> I don't give a fuck, people. I have provided you with 161 episodes of quality entertainment. I'm allowed to take a little bit of time to talk about my life. Hell and yeah. I love Mark Lombardo. And, yeah, and we all think, of, Lombardo. think of him as my <laughs> third it's, son. It's, it's yeah. Mike. Yes. What did I say? Mark. Mark. Well, that's because I was burping. <laughs> I... I love that crazy little... Mark Lombardo is pretty awesome, isn't he? Yeah. I love Joe Lombardo. Yeah. Mike, Mike's brother. Yeah, he's pretty um, cool, too. No, I, look, his name is look, I, I think of Mike as a third son, yeah. and I will break his balls if I want to break that's his right. balls. And if you don't understand that that's a joke, then yeah. you know, go listen to Three Guys with Beards, where there's no humor. There's no jokes, yeah. There's absolutely no jokes. By the way, you noticed that yeah, I've been growing a beard, which was, was Phoebe's idea. I, I so then I can now guest host on Three Guys with Beards. Well, you'd be on there more than Mayberry is. Well, that's not hard. Have he's you never have on. you noticed? That he's never on that show. See, that one. We're, they're gonna they're gonna record a three guys with beards at scares the care weekend this year in yeah. August yeah. and I think you and I should bum rush oh, we have to. that recording and and put Mayberry on the spot and demand yeah. to know why he won't appear on his own show yeah. with Golden and Moore. Well, I think we've already you just answered the question right there. Why he won't appear on the show with Golden and Moore? Yeah. Yeah, right ah. there. I, think we, I think we've answered the question, but if we bum rush their show. We will automatically give them five minutes of the best of their shows ever been. I think. I think it's, it'll be kind of like the time that I bum rushed Kelly Owens' podcast, and she edited out my appearance. They uh, what the what? Yeah. Oh yeah, you didn't know about that? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Does care. Kelly Owen? Does no? I love Kelly. I, she was just here to play Magic the yeah. Gathering. This yeah. week, but does she still have a podcast? No, no, no. she's not no, doing, she's it, she's doing it. I. No. I thought, and if, if I'm wrong, she can. Correct me and yell at me, which it's Kelly. She'll yell at you if she's wrong. I thought she was going to do one final episode. I thought she, she had talked about. She's not done yet, but she had talked about it online earlier a few weeks ago. Back, she was like, "If I do one final podcast, what do you want me to talk about?" But she does. She has stopped doing it. Yeah. She talked about that when she was on here. Well, I know, and last then I, year. I, but then she did a few did after a few. that. Yeah, I think and she, and I then I noticed it hadn't updated again. No, well. I think I, she kind of said. When she was on and she talked about it, and again, if I'm talking out of turn, Kelly, please correct me. She's not the same person that she she's, right. a lot. she's She can't do that ranting anymore. She doesn't want to do it, right. which is understandable. All right. I mean, so, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, she did her podcast one time, and I, I came in the room and was at, and everybody said you were the best part, and she chopped me out. So, oh, <laughs> again, you know, we were thinking the other day, uh, why is it, you know, they have all these conventions around the country. 
Yeah, you know, we we had, we did that story the other week. They were talking about the the convention, the the, the monster mania with the huge crowd. Yeah, right. and um, you know they they bring in the cast of Stranger Things or The Walking Dead. Why aren't any these conventions bringing in the cast of the horror show of Brian Keene? Well, they do. They no, bring no, no, they no. bring in me. No, 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 no. The whole cast. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with a, Ooh. appearance fees. Uh, I would like an appearance. Mary, wouldn't you like an appearance fee? I would fee? indeed. I'll Phoebe. come for free. No. I just want to be invited. No, 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 no. Phoebe. Phoebe. <laughs> Y'all don't get appearance fees? Phoebe, you're not helping. Uh, uh, I work all the time. Games. Sometimes. Wow, see, there's another example of privilege. Like yeah. we were talking about, I just yeah. assumed everybody's getting an appearance fee. No, I mean, I, it's been better lately, but yeah, no, I don't always get... I don't no one gives money. me jack shit. <laughs> huh. I... I'm the lunch lady. And I, I work for pretty cheap, anywhere. too. I mean, it wouldn't be like, you you know, to drop, like, you know, a few K on me. I mean, I'm like, you're like, here, I, I $200 in a sandwich. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, they, they, they spend all these money on these other people. They could spend some money on us. All right. Well, and then where's our TV deal? Yes. That, that's, Hello, TV people. That's what I'm waiting for. All right. Well, you know what I'm waiting for and what our listeners are waiting for is Grady <laughs> Hendrix. <laughs> so let's go to that. We'll catch you on the flip side. Well, Hello. We're here with Grady Hendrix, who has quite the unconventional and varied career. I'm very excited to be stealing you from Brian. Uh, he wanted to be here to do this. He listed Paperbacks from Hell as one of his top books of the year that he read. He loved it. Nice. So, Where is he? He had to travel last weekend mm. to Tennessee. So he's babysitting the cats. Uh, the cats, they'll Mostly hold you back they're, every they're time. My, they're my babies, yeah. and I don't like to leave them alone, so he's uh, he's with the cats. Fair enough. <laughs> so, ha-ha, baby. <laughs> so, yes, so Grady has quite quite the awesome career. We were, we were uh, talking about it in the hotel, actually, before. Um, you've done a little bit of everything. Like, I almost don't even know where to start. Uh, yeah, it doesn't feel. It just feels like a weird, messed up life without much planning or or, or goals. Uh, just sort of wandering. Um, you know, I did the. I was one of the guys who founded the New York Asian Film Festival, and that right. ran for years and years. Although these days, I sit on the board and actually, I mostly just sort of ignore emails. But there's dudes That's running it now guess. who are doing a much better job than I could be. So it, the less I pay attention to it, the better it seems to get. Um, and then I was a journalist for about ten years. Um, for a while. I answered phones at this parapsychology research uh, organization. Yes. Um, and then journalism started to die in like 2008. And I decided to, to double down on, um, on on being stupid and started writing fiction more. <laughs> um, and that's where I am these days. And do these other jobs, do they impact, you think, the, what you write, how you write? I think, I, not in a way I'm conscious of, but they have to. They I must, mean, right? you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, you know, like working with the ASPR, the American Society for Psychical Research. That's was, what I wanted to ask you about, yeah, yes. Was really amazing. And that had this real impact you know, on my life. I mean, it made me a much nicer person. Um, it was, I just answered a Craigslist ad. Uh, they needed someone to answer phones at a nonprofit. And so I went and I needed work. And my wife and I had been living in uh, Hong Kong for a little bit and we had just moved back to the States and you need a job. And so, um, and she was like well on the way in her career. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so I answered this ad and I went in, it was the ASPR, which had been founded in um, like 1885 by William James to investigate spiritualists mostly. Okay. Um, and um, at the time, I was sort of, they had this big brownstone across from the Dakota and um, the where John Lennon got shot. Uh, one has nothing to do with the other. Uh, but, um, and so I was sort of the only employee. The board guys were out raising money and doing these longer range research projects. And, um, and, and so they were in and out some, but it was often just me answering the phones. And they had this amazing library and archive that I sort of went through and, and did a little work to, to do some preservation and digital scanning of papers. But um, it was really fascinating. My boss was this woman, incredibly smart woman, um, who really, to this day, I don't know why she's not like, running the country or something uh, and is at the ASPR but on the first day she said to me you know we're going to get you're going to get a lot of calls like are, we're listed in all the phone books because it's 1999 phone books we're still around right and she said a lot of people are going to call here and tell you they've had some experience and she said you know uh, you can't validate what they're telling you um, they might be crazy they might be off their meds they mm -hmm. might be drunk they might be messing with you they might be deluded you don't know and she said at the same time you can't invalidate them because these are people having some experience. You don't know them. Maybe there are ghosts. Who knows? Like right, you, what, right. what do you think you're so smart? 
So not validate, not invalidate. And so mostly what I did was listen. Um, and a lot of people really did want to talk to someone who would, and then talk about these experiences, someone who was just listening and not judging. And um, it was fascinating. It was really sort of a, a really kind of humbling experience. And it was interesting to be working in the archives because um, a little bit, because a lot of things that people were reporting in like the 19th century were very, very similar to what people were talking about now on the phone. And um, and so and what I realized was like, I, I don't know, man, I, I I don't know if any of this stuff is real or not real. And I think that's the least interesting aspect of it. Uh -huh. But to me, this is a real seeing a ghost, having some kind of experience like that, that seems outside of what we consider reality and every day it's a really common human experience you know and and that was something that the spr sort of the branch we split off from in the 19th century d discovered when they did their first sort of giant census of what they called apparitions which were asking people what their experiences were is that these experiences they're really common they're not a sign you're insane i mean you may be insane but this isn't a sign of that right. they're not a sign that you're delusional you may be delusional but this doesn't necessarily that it seems to be a very human experience. And so to be dismissive about it or, you know, right, someone's right. going through something and this is how they're processing it. If you say to them, well, ghosts aren't real, like you're being an asshole. This is the right. context they're experiencing it. And, and, and it's often a really profound experience to people. Um, so yeah, I, so it really did a lot to turn a 28 year old asshole into sort of a less judgmental jerk. Sort of a more sensitive. Well, we we know, we know somebody, Brian and I, who um, used to work with UFO researchers, mm -hmm. people uh, interviewing abductees, and she basically said the same thing. She says, "I don't know what." happened to these people, but clearly a real thing happened to them. Sure. I imagine it's probably the same kind of feeling. Right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I was nine, I thought I saw a ghost and now I know, like, I know exactly. I mean, it was the way the street light hit this thing. But at the time at nine, I processed it like I was seeing a ghost, someone who wasn't there. And it was really profound and unsettling. And, and right. I'm kind of, I think it's great. I had that experience. I know what that feels like. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just think this is just, I think you know, I do this show, I'm doing it today at six, actually, called Summerland Lost. That's sort of the story right. of spiritualism in America, because it crossed over with the labor movement, with the suffragette movement, the abolition movement. And it was sort of the first time women were able to hold jobs that weren't piecework and in sweatshops. Right, right. And so I tell the story of the Fox sisters, who were these two basically hillbillies from upstate New York, teenage girls, uh -huh. who wound up being two of the most famous women in the world and then died on the streets. Um, and it's this amazing story. And the least interesting part of that story is whether it was real or they were faking it. You know, right, like, like right. that is the least interesting part. I mean, you know, the first woman decorated in combat was a spiritualist chaplain. The first female stockbrokers were spiritualist mediums. Um, like, like whether they were con artists or not, and many of them were con artists, who cares, man? This is fascinating. Right. I don't talk about it in the show. And the, the cons, some of them did pull. Um, were fascinating. I mean, there was one woman who was backed by a dude financially, and she established a health club in Manhattan in the 1880s or 90s, I think. Uh -huh. And, you know, Turkish baths and like a club room where rich men could sit around. They got massages. Everyone in that club was a spy for her. And they would funnel back information that she would use to get into these rich families and stun them with things there was no way she could possibly know. Wow. She opened a club, a building, to do nothing but get this information for these sittings. I mean, that's fascinating. That, that's Ocean's Eleven. That's kind of smart about it. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's sort of, sort of sinisterly brilliant about that. Oh, you know, it's, a, you know, it's one of the things I say in the show, but when spiritualism hit, this was an unleashing of talent the world had never seen. I mean, people who had been relegated, your job is to sit home and have babies, right. suddenly were like, well, actually, I can write French with my right hand, English backwards with my left mm -hmm. hand, speak Latin at the same time, all while pretending to be delivering and synthesizing information I'm getting from a cold reading on someone sitting in a across from me. Wow. Like, you know, it's, so it's like the only way they could show their natural talents was by showing a somewhat supernatural talent. Well, what other outlet was there? Right, I mean, some right. could become writers and, and you could become an activist, but there were a lot of limits to that. And if right. you wanted cash, yes. this was where you went, you know? That is fascinating. I, I wish we could stick around to, to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that's, if, that's really if awesome. we wanted to see your show, or if someone in the audience wanted to see your show, well, how would they? So basically, GradyHendricks.com is my site, and uh, on the event page, I sort of keep everything that's coming up. And I'm doing Summerland Lost 
now. I'm doing it in New Orleans later on. The dates are on there. And I'm doing it in, I think, in Tennessee, in Chattanooga. Oh, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. so I do this all. And I do the Paperbacks from Hell live show a lot. So right, it's all right. on the event page there. And I keep it updated as best as I can. That's awesome. So that's anyways, that was a really long monologue no, answering no, no. your question. No, but see, that's, I, I, I've been curious about that because that was one of the first things that shows up you know, in, mm-hmm. your, in your bio. And I, like, I wonder if that would have a profound effect on how you feel about things spiritually. I mean, whether it's true or not, the idea that so many people over such a large span of time are reporting similar things without even knowing each other. There's got to be at least something that says, whatever it is, there's something bigger out there. Well, I mean, I mean, that's possible. Like, I'm not gonna, like, who knows? Like, within the context of my life, like, okay. Um, (laughs) You know, but like, uh, what's interesting to me is people really do crave some kind of connection with something bigger than themselves. Yes. And, um, and I, and I think, you know, people want an outlet like that. For Mm -hmm. some people it's church, for some people it's hospice work or volunteer work, for some people it's belief in the supernatural, but people really want to feel connected to something bigger than they are. Right, Um, right. And it's a really profound belief, and I actually, and I don't mean to to rant, but I really do feel like like we kind of neglect that at our peril. Um, And and I feel, and and I just think, you know, I, I, I mean, look, I have, I think science is amazing and rationality. And I I think sometimes the skeptic societies bend over a little backwards to be the smartest guy in the room and they wind up looking like twits. But, and I do think, you know, there are places where people get exploited and all that stuff. Right. Um, right. You know, if if there's, if there's a good thing out there, someone will find a way to use it to exploit people. Exactly. But to me, it's also like to deny that this is a part of human kind of experience and what people want is also to not serve folks well. Yeah, um, no, I agree. I so, agree. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's like you see it in fandom a lot. I mean, I love going to, like, uh, New York Comic Con and stuff because uh-huh. you're in a room full of people who, I mean, they are people trying to make money and there's people who've got their hustles and they make stuff and stuff. But for the most part, people are just there because they genuinely love something. And they love it right. so much they're willing to look like a jackass in public, you know, <laughs> over it. And, and that's, like, really <laughs> profound. And, and they really feel connected to these fictional worlds and these fictional yeah. characters and and I hear them like you know I've I've had imaginary friends who've gotten me through very rough mm-hmm. patches in my life and and I think it's kind of like that's that's fine it's that's great it's almost like a new mythology that yeah. people are creating like superheroes are almost like the new gods on Olympus you know yeah exactly and it's not just superheroes you know you'll see people who are really into like one particular Pokemon or mm-hmm. one particular mm-hmm. Sailor Moon character and they really like they, they project a lot onto that and, right. and for them, it's like a really important thing. And for me, I feel the same way, you know, look, mm-hmm. people with their pets, your, yes. your pet's personality is not what you think it is. It's, oh, right. it's, it's something that you and your pet have created together, this sort of mm-hmm. third personality. And, and that's really profound. I mean, I've had pets. It's really a profound experience to feel sort of connected, connected. to this right. other thing that kind of like would eat you if you just held still for long enough. <laughs> You're right, though. <laughs> uh, although they do say they do say dogs would last longer than cats. I'm a cat person. Yeah, person. dogs. Yeah. But they said that dogs, out of respect for you, would probably go about a week longer than cats. I cats will eat that. you a few days after you die. I was just talking but, to someone whose uncle's second wife died and got eaten by her cats. Um, and yeah, like, yeah, like, cats are like, okay, well, it's over and done with. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> You'd want this for me, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're just letting all this go to waste. Right, it's right. so delicious. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is not how nature is meant to be. <laughs> so, but in addition to working for the, it's, what is it? A- ASPR. Yeah, ASPR. Yeah. Um, you also do a lot of journalism. You wrote for Playboy. Yeah. Right? You wrote for... Uh, New York Post. I mean, yep. it's pretty impressive places. You're a film critic for the New York Sun. Yeah. Um, and you did some young adult stuff. The, Man- the Magnolia League? Yeah, that was my best friend from high school, Katie Crouch. She's actually like my first girlfriend for like six weeks and then she dumped me. Oh, <laughs> the one that got away. I know. But we've known each other like almost all our lives. And um, she's a big, she had a big literary fiction career. She was doing some YA. And um, and this Magnolia Lee books were set in near where we grew up, and um, she got pregnant with her kid, and like was really like worried about hitting her deadlines, and so she asked if I wanted to come in and write them with her, and and we had a blast doing it. Um, yeah. You know, I feel like YA is a really weird area to write in. It's um, it's the only 
books that aren't written by the people who read them. Like, like, yes, like, yes, it, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, like women are big readers of romance mostly. Women okay. romance are written by women. Uh, African American sort of urban fiction, like mostly those right. are African American writers. YA is adults writing for kids, and it's a yes. very complicated minefield to navigate. And there's some YA books I love, and there's a lot that I feel like is, is just cash-ins that really yeah. depress me. Because I remember how important books were to me as a kid, and how much they yes. spoke to me, and how personal mm -hmm. the attachment felt. And, and when I talk to an author or an editor or something who's talking about, oh, we're going to do this, and it's like this, and it's going to make a lot of money, right. I'm just like, ugh. I just yeah. feel like those, uh, I feel so bad. Like A lot of them are like sort of uh, follow-ups to ones that, you know, like The Hunger Games yeah. or you know, Harry Potter or they're sort of, and I think, you know, it, it, it's good if it's getting kids to read, I'm all for it, yeah. but I know what you mean. Like there's, there's, a, there's a, something of a disconnect because we're not kids, you right. know, and it's like a weird in-between place that they're... A lot of them are reading like a grade or like a couple of grade levels. Oh yeah, older. kids read so up. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it's if it's getting kids to read, it's great. Like I, I think young adult stuff is kind of awesome. But you're right. I, I would imagine it's a different kind of. Well, it's also writing. you know editors are much more involved because mm -hmm. they situate themselves as they're the translators between kids' tastes and your tastes, and right. so it becomes really dependent on the individual editors. And some are great, some aren't. And you know, if there's Sturgeon's law, ninety percent of everything's it's crap. crap. Right. So ninety percent of wine has <laughs> always been crap. Ninety percent right. of all books have been crap. Um, and so, you know, I just, sometimes I see some very cynical people doing YA and it, re it really bums me out. I, but you know, yeah, whatever, yeah, I'm, I'm cynical, that. so. Um, but and even, even in, in writing in general though, you've done some unconventional things. Like you've done a, it says it's, it's a, the Dirt Candy is oh. described as a graphic novel slash cookbook slash memoir. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> well, so my wife is a chef and she owns this restaurant called okay. Dark Candy in New York. It's about 10 years old this year. And people kept asking her to write a cookbook and, um, and sh she really didn't want to just do another book. Um, you know, pretty pictures of food, veg recipes, and no one cares. Right, right. Um, and she and I were walking down the street one day because so many people were asking her and it was like, and the restaurant was doing well. And we were having a fight like we always do. And uh, I, at one point, was like, you know, Screw this stupid cookbook. You should just do a stupid like comic book cookbook. And we both stopped and we're like, oh my god, that's a really great idea. An awesome idea. And it was really hard to pull off because we were working with a cookbook imprint at Random House. It wasn't used to doing graphic novels and it's a totally right. different production schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really hard. But um, we're really happy with the results. Um, we wish it had been more graphic novel. -y. Like we want to do the recipes actually visually. Right, and right. the publisher sort of drew the line. They're like, well, you need to give some people something that feels familiar like a cookbook Cook fish, right? um but even with that even with it only being like 75 percent of what we want it to be mm -hmm. really happy with it it's like in its seventh printing now and doing really it's well awesome. yeah yeah which That's is great awesome. but but you know my wife and i um if you have a restaurant it kind of eats your life um and our yeah. restaurants like our our child that wants to murder us and it takes all our money and it's never going to attend our funeral or do anything oh, nice for it us take care of you your old exactly age. and so it's like having this big hateful baby all the time um and we're like you're 10 you should be in like fifth grade like, right you should be like winning prizes you should uh, at least be able to put your pants on by yourself exactly um so yeah so that's awesome and you've also done um because one of the questions i do want to ask you is how you decided to go from nonfiction to fiction, but um, Steve Kozanuski, who is also on the show today, thank you, thank guest co-host Steve Kozanuski, um, we were talking about horror store. I'm pronouncing that right, yeah, yeah. horror store, where it's it's kind of like an IKEA catalog, but with like a story going on in the background. Right. How did that come about? Like, that was really so i was um so i had a manuscript called mcmansions of the damned and um <laughs> i sent it to quirk my publisher and uh -huh. my editor jason rakulik rejected it but he sort of liked the writing style and he called me and we're chatting trying to see if there's some project we can work on together and all editors have all these projects they keep wanting someone to bring to him and he's like right. yeah, i'd love to do a project that's like a big box store you know like a haunted right. big box store and we were like and we were talking we we're like oh god ikea and like the next day, he had sent me this email that was like, oh, you know, we can lay it out like a catalog and do the cover and all this. So, so cool. it's sort of a very Roger Corman AIP experience where it's like right. we had the design and the idea before we actually had a story. Right, um, right. And so, and then, so I, you know, I wrote the book um, and then went on working with them. But 
uh, I really like them because they're a smaller publisher, but they let me get involved with like the design and things like that. And so it wasn't going to all be an Ikea catalog throughout, but then the designer and I got talking and we're like, what if we did this? And I was like, well, what about this? And she'd be like, what about this? And so it was really nice to have that back and forth and like have stuff come out of there. It's really, I mean, because it, it's kind of fascinating that um, a lot of the projects that you've talked about working on are almost, um, rather, in addition to being almost like cross genre kind of stuff, mm-hmm. it's almost like cross media stuff, which uh, a lot of conversations that we've had on the horror show and in, in other places, that, that seems to be the movement, like the, the future movement of publishing is that a lot of cross media kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, think, I don't think you're wrong. I mean, you know, um, if you want someone to buy a book and have it sitting around their house, it should look pretty good. Um, and right, often that means right. you need to do something beyond just the book. Um, and it's fun. I mean, it was so fun to put Horror Store together. And I think we're at a point where audiences and readers are so savvy that um, and, and culturally literate that, like, you don't have to worry about alienating them by the format or the form. Right. Yeah, as, no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, as yeah. long as the story works, it works. And I think that's sort of become the bottom line for a lot of people. Do you think it pulls in other kinds of readers, though, to have something cross media like that I don't know actually it, it's yeah. it's interesting um I'm always so bummed out by how few readers there are in general in general like, yeah like yeah. I don't look at my sales numbers because my books do really well but like publishing numbers are terrible <laughs> like you know what I mean <laughs> right, right. like um uh, they're just depressing regardless across the board exactly I mean, um so even a book that's doing really well you're like 70,000 copies? That's, <laughs> really? Like, not even 100,000? Like, what? Where are, where are the billions of people on this planet? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Like, uh, Paperbacks from Hell that I did, we, we did, we sort of reverse engineered the math because we had so many pre-orders. We thought, oh my God, it's going to be on the New York Times bestsellers. I'm going right, to be able to right. be New York Times bestselling author Grady Hendricks after every bio, you know? <laughs> and um, and so we, we didn't make the list the first week. And so we reverse engineered the nonfiction paperback list, my, my editor and I, and we realized that we missed it by 200 to 300 copies. No. And the book that made it into the number 10 place had sold, I think it was, I think it was 2,000 and 100 copies that week, according to BookScan. And it's like, right. that's it? That's all you need to be number 10 on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list is 2,000 and something copies? Like, yeah, that's it's sort of an eye-opener when, you, when you're see, you seeing how the New York Times bestseller list works. But yeah, sometimes it's it's these little marginal numbers. Oh my so. God, it's crazy. And like, you know, Horror Store, I'm really lucky because it has that Ikea connection. Uh-huh. Um, everyone knows Ikea. Right, um, right. And so we were able to do a lot of foreign sales off of that and all that. I mean... But with my best friend's exorcism next, there wasn't that, um, you know, people in Thailand don't care. Uh, They care about Ikea. They don't care Mm -hmm. about me. And so um, it was interesting to see foreign sales did fine for my best friend's exorcism, but the horror store foreign sales were amazing. And so it's like, it's so sobering as a writer to just be like, you know, Mm -hmm. if I was just a happy meal, I would be so much more, (laughs) if I was just a toy in a happy meal, you know, if someone would just make a crappy TV show based on books, they don't even have to watch. It could be on like, it could be on like stars elite streaming <laughs> access extra pay-per-view straight, straight to pay-per-view I, and suddenly yeah. your readership just shoots through mm-hmm. the roof it is crazy to me how few readers are so this goes back to what you're saying about cross platforms mm-hmm. I kind of feel like you almost have to be these days maybe that's like right, yeah I, that's what I tend to think is that I, I that that seems to be the direction that things are going anyway but yeah you yeah, know I, I agree with you totally but then in having done most of nonfiction stuff was fiction something you always wanted to do or was it oh, something yeah. that you figured out what the hell I'll give it a shot no I had always wanted to and I, I'm a big chicken and so I was like I waited until 08 when like literally there were no more freelance jobs like freelancers I mean the the internet was killing print media every paper was exploding um, you know there were freelancers wandering the streets of New York like zombies being like, I will write for a byline <laughs> right, um, for a hamburger exactly <laughs> um, and so it was, so I, um, I was like you know it's sort of now or never um, and right, so I went right. to Clarion and I got in and okay. that in 2009 and that really changed my life that was sort of like oh I'm around other people who do this and they don't think it's full of shit um, and it yeah. was kind of amazing and I, I'm old I grew up when like you know pre Harry Potter like mm-hmm. if you took a book about wizards to school people would beat you up and yes. I would be there with them like being right. a nerd wasn't cool or hip mm-hmm. and so for me it was really jarring to suddenly be in a room full of people who took that seriously and wanted right. to engage in it 
And, um, and, and, and it really made me sort of check my judgmental assholeism at the door and sort of either like commit a hundred percent or what am I doing? You know, right, like, um, right. and, and it was really, really a sort of humbling, eye opening experience for me. And after that, it was just writing and writing and writing and writing until I could get places. And do you like doing fiction better than nonfiction? Yeah, but do you have a preference, really? Like, you know, it's interesting. Like, I do a lot of research. I love doing research. And so, in a way, I like nonfiction a little better. It's hard. Right. Because right. in fiction, you could write the car. You know, they got you the car and up. drove it. Yeah, yeah. It's all made up. And in nonfiction, every one of those sentences has to be true. And it's, right. it's a pain. <laughs> um, and, and so, um, but I love doing research. The thing is, nonfiction just doesn't pay. Um, you know, the, really? the articles I've written that, you know, I'm the most proud of. You know, I did a thing about novelizations for Film Comment Magazine, and that thing was like, I was interviewing people and going back, doing all this research for months, you know, the right. first novelization, who wrote, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, I got $800 for that article, and it took me like four months of work. Not full-time right. work, but like, right. it's but just, still, the money's yeah. not there. You know what I That's mean? That's interesting, because um, I was always under the impression that nonfiction paid better than fiction. Well, maybe in books. it depends on where you're... Yeah, probably in books. Maybe right. And also, if you can write a nonfiction book that's like, um, I don't know, um, uh, uh, Carpet, the untold story of how floor coverings shape the modern world. <laughs> like, you can probably do okay right. with something like that. I mean, that's right. a hot pitch. Um, but, like, you know, the kind of nonfiction I do, which is very pop culture oriented and sort of right. like weird, often little niches, uh -huh. no one cares about. I hear you. I hear you. Um, speaking of the nonfiction book, Paperbacks from hell. People love it. I mean, it's it's kind of all all I heard about for months when it first. Oh, came I'm out. so sorry. And, oh, no, 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 it's great. It's great. And everybody in our field is just like, yay! This is like the greatest thing ever. I mean, it was like kids in a candy store because we were all sort of at that age where we remember those book yeah. covers when we were kids oh, me too. and things like that. Um, and Brian too. Uh, Brian and Dave both like they just they were super excited about about having the book and. Um, uh, he sent me a couple of questions because um, for the folks listening at home, uh, we're at StokerCon this weekend where we have stolen Grady to interview him. Uh, so Brian is not here and Dave is not here. Uh -huh. So uh, he did. He emailed me some questions. Or sure. He, he, like, texted no, and, me and questions. Brian's been enormously kind to this book. So oh, he yeah. loves it. Yeah, just, yeah. He he. Uh, you want to talk about people who react like a kid at the candy store? Like he's just like I love it. I love it. I love it. Because he loves like the covers and he, yeah. I mean, we remember all those like those those old like holographic covers, the ones oh with the God. cutouts yeah. and all those. Um, so he wanted to know what the most difficult part of compiling paperbacks from hell was. Is it the research? Was it getting the rights to use the cover art, which also because you said you did a pre you do a presentation. Yeah. Um, do you have to like get permission to do that in your presentations? Well, like, it's interesting. Work? So, so, what, well, so two questions. So the the hardest part of this was figuring out what it was. Like okay. I literally just had this. I was writing these columns for Tor, and my editor uh -huh. really liked them. He's like, you know, I don't think we'd ever pitch this, and you you're between two novels on your contract, and I don't think I've done, but. If you wanted to pitch a book version of this, I would take it to sales and marketing and see what they said. And I was like, cool, well, yeah. Um, and so I did, and they went for it. And so, but it meant I had a really short amount of time to do it. And also, I didn't know what the story was. Like, you know what I right. mean? I knew right. that there was Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist back then, but, but then what? Where'd these books go? And right. so Will Erickson, who does Too Much Horror Fiction, that blog about horror novels, right. he's been doing this for like 10 years. And so I, I hired Will as sort of a researcher and a co-pilot on this. And we spent like a couple of days on the phone just talking this out. Like, what? What is it? Do we do it by monster? Do we do it by? Ch what is it? And what do we? Well, I finally figured out is that there is a, a history here. There is this sort of this this from nothing to this boom to this bust. And and so I decided to follow it chronologically. And, and it was nice because you start with Satan and you know all that. Right. And then you end with serial killers and splatter punk. And it kind of right. it makes some kind of sense. Um, but the covers were tough. So quirk. Uh, believed that and feels very strongly that there's a fair use argument for using these covers okay. um, and um, in an educational context. And they also feel like the artists don't own the covers. The artists own the underlying artwork. Um, and some don't, gotcha. but many do. But the actual cover that's put together with the fonts on it and it's trimmed to size and all that, a, it exists in a copyright terms as a separate work. Okay. And the publisher owns that. 
And because Quirk's um, uh, distributor is Penguin Random House, who has absorbed so many of these labels and these imprints, right, right. they went to them and were like, would you have a problem with this? And, and the people they talked to were like, I don't think anyone here would have a problem. We don't know. We don't know officially or anything. Right, right. We don't think it's, as far as we know, we don't see this as a big deal, but we'd have to see the finished product. So they agreed to go ahead. I really felt like from a sort of moral point of view, I really wanted the artists on my side and right. I wanted to interview them and talk to them. I wanted to be excited about the book. And I felt like they had to, um, I had to license this stuff. And I actually talked to this guy, Vinny DeFate, who was a big science fiction cover illustrator and he teaches at a uh, school of visual arts now. And he was, oh no, sorry, at FIT now. And he was like, you got to do it. He said, you know, this is just the right thing to do. And so any artist I could find, I approached them and I, I paid out of pocket. Uh, to license their artwork and it wasn't a ton of money and right, right. very few said no and most were really happy to see this stuff again this is work way in their rear view mirror right, and and right. I gotta say one of the joys of this book is, is how excited so many of these artists have been and how much they participated and taken it to heart and they some of them sell it at conventions now I've done live appearances with some of the artists and done Q&A's and things oh, and wow. it's really these guys invested these paintings with so much technique and so right. much emotion. Often the models for these are their children, their friends, people who've passed away, right. people who are older now. And um, and, and these they've invested a lot of emotion and technique, and it's not their fault that this is a disposable medium. You know what right. I mean? Or, like, that, or that the person basically that getting all the credit for the book that has this cover, which is probably the reason readers bought the book in the first exactly. place. Exactly. It really, it's the writer that's, you know, yeah. getting all the... The credit for it. Exactly. And so a lot of them are really, really happy to just to just be able to sort of look back at this part of their career and yeah. feel like other people are excited about it. Right, um, some right. of them were very embarrassed by this work. Some of them oh, just really? hadn't, oh yeah, and some of them just hadn't thought about it in a long time. And so it was really interesting to, to be part of that. Now the people who were embarrassed by it, were they surprised at the nostalgic affection that people have for these kinds of covers? Oh, completely. I mean, it really? took them totally by surprise. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and some of them just haven't thought about this part of their career in a long time. Like yeah. Tom Hallman, he sort of still does book covers, and he was sort of like, God, I haven't even looked at these paintings in ages. Are you sure that one? I'm pretty sure that one's mine. Like, <laughs> but, but like, he, and he emailed me recently. He's like, he's like, you know, I just want to say thanks. He's like, it was interesting to pull out all these old paintings and sort of reevaluate them and see where I was and where I've come. And he's like, I kind of wouldn't have done it if someone hadn't poked me because this is just old work I hadn't looked at. Um, yeah, so it's it's been really, you know, the it's weird in a very arrogant way i kind of feel like I, i've been allowed to sort of protect this tiny bit of this legacy and keep this little right, candle right, burning right. um and 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 I, i've been i mean i take that really seriously um some of these books are amazing um there are so many more female authors than i expected to come across who've just sort of been written out of the canon and the narrative yeah. of oh, horror yeah. um and so to be able to help bring some of that back to light and this sounds so cheesy but for me it's like real honor um, no no I, I can see that I, yeah. I mean it's it's a I, I could see paperbacks from hell becoming sort of a seminal work in the examination of that era of horror I mean which well I, hope I think it's a, a lot of people tend to dismiss as being like oh yeah that was the horror boom where all the crap came out exactly and that's not always the case I mean there was a lot of good stuff that came out oh yeah too, absolutely you know and and you know it's interesting um just sort of I, I this book, I hope, is like a starting place. I hope other people use it to then write better books about, like, you know what I mean? To sort of like, okay, here's a little bit of a clearing. And right, so now we can right. start hacking into the underbrush that way. Like, to me, this is like a start. And I hope other people take it up. I hope so, too. Because I, I, I like the idea of there being sort of a chronology of, the, like, the history of our genre. Yeah. Which leads me to, uh, like, did it take a long time to prepare this? I mean, Okay, so... From the time I signed the contract on the time this book hit shelves was 13 months, um, okay. which meant I had a little under eight months to write it. Uh, and and that, do the research And too? do the research. So okay, okay. I read a few hundred of these paperbacks in that time and wow. wrote this, and we got right up to that. They had to print it in China. Quirk usually prints in Canada, but because it was color and so expensive, right, they had to print right. in China to make it like financially viable. And we had a hard deadline when these like these like documents had to be in China if they were going to hit a boat that was going to hit the pub date and I remember when they got the page proofs back to me uh, it was like four o'clock on a Friday afternoon 
and I went to my office with those page proofs, and uh-huh. I was awake until Monday morning at noon when I sent them back to Quirk. Oh my God. Um, it was just, we had no choice. By Tuesday, they had to go to China, and Quirk had to do a final copy edit. And this wow. is like dates and names and all that, and there are mistakes in it that people have pointed out. Less than I thought, so I'm happy about well, that's that. Good. But yeah. yeah, but like, yeah, I'd like, you know, who wrote Watership Down? Richard Adams or Richard Harris, the famous actor? Well, according to me, it's Richard Harris, the famous actor. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it was it was a it was rough. I mean, I was I learned that I can do three paperbacks in a day if I'm reading them, kind of four on a stretch. A few days were six book days, and oh like I was God. just wiped out the next day. So yeah. then what you have is two three book days, so that doesn't work. Right, um, right. And my wife would just be going to work, and I'm sitting on the couch reading these paperbacks, and she's like, "Get a job, come <laughs> back." I'm going to this restaurant that's draining yeah. all over. She comes home with scars and burns all over her hands. I'm you like, yeah, my, my fingertips ache from typing. I've been reading too I have hard. I cramp in my foot from having it propped up yeah. for so long. I read all day. So now, is there stuff that you left out that you oh, wished you could have included? There's a whole chapter I actually had written on Nazi books. Nazis were a big thing. Uh, really? Oh, yeah, a whole chapter. Of them. And there's a great book by Saul Stein called The Resort, which is about a health resort in Big Sur, California, that only reaches out and does aggressive marketing to Jewish customers. Uh-huh. And then when they come, they drug them and keep them on drugs and turn them into because uh, a slave workforce that works on their underground marijuana farm, the proceeds of which are going to pay for the resurrection of the Fourth Reich. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of bonkers Nazi books out there. Those got left out. Um, I wish I'd be able to go deeper on a lot of people. I really yeah. wish I'd had the time to read a lot more V.C. Andrews and like give mm-hmm. her more pages because she's huge. Yeah. Um, and now I'm finding stuff afterwards people are pointing out to me that I just missed. Um, right. There's so much more YA horror that I missed that I want to go back to. Um, there's, you know, E. Howard Hunt, the convicted Watergate conspirator. Uh-huh. Um, he wrote horror paperbacks. Really? Uh, yeah. He had a big oh, wow. career writing horror and thriller paperbacks. And they, and they blurb him on the author, convicted Watergate co-conspirator E. <laughs> Howard Hunt. Um, Christina Crawford, Joan Crawford's daughter, she wrote a horror paperback. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I mean, there's so I missed a lot of stuff. Would you do another edition of this? You know, like, it's interesting. In a volume two of. I'm not quite at the point to do a volume two, but one thing right. I've been fooling around with is um, doing a YA version and going oh, back cool. to the 50s and coming forward because there's all this YA that's just been forgotten, and a lot of it's horror, a lot right. of it's genre, and it really is treated as sort of disposable. Mm-hmm. Um, the classics stay in print, but a lot of this stuff disappears. Right. Um, right. So it's like, you know, I don't know if you remember that book, Hatchet, about the kid in Canada. Yeah. Who like, yeah. yeah. And so, did you know how many sequels that has? And it has one sequel where the U.S., the Pentagon is so astonished at survival skills that they throw him into the wilderness again with just the hatchet with a government psychologist to like tell us how Navy SEALs can be so good survival people like you. It's insane. I mean, it's bonkers. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I've been thinking about that, but I don't know if there's enough there, but you know, it's right. And this was right. a big, this, this took a chunk out of me. So I mean, I'm a little gun shy right now. I hear you. That's a lot of work to yeah. do in a very short period of time. Um, I did want to follow up on what Mary yes. said. Uh, it's not just the Bryans and Daves. I mean, obviously these are the super horror fans, but I have what Mary was saying about on Facebook and Twitter, everybody, everybody talking about paperbacks from hell. Yeah. And it's the younger people who, like me, who only kind of vaguely remember that. Right. And now they're getting into it. Yeah. And I think you've kind of passed that torch on. Oh, good. And, it, but it's... It, it, it is the Bryans and the Daves are getting that nostalgia kick. Oh, yeah. I but, think, yeah, for us, it's like a nostalgia thing. Yeah, but I think for but, the next generation, it's mm-hmm. like a, oh, I didn't know, like you were saying, uh, this lost history yeah. kind of thing. I didn't know yeah. about it. Well, you know, it's interesting because, like, I, I got into Hong Kong movies when I was in university and then started, you know, with these other guys, this New York Asian film festival, and our first love was Hong Kong stuff. And our feeling was always, like, because people always complain, oh, movies, Hollywood's so crappy, you know, there's something out there. We're like, dudes, if you don't like this, there's Hong Kong over here. Every movie's got subtitles. They've got the stars. You just have to learn who they are. Right, they have these right. big budgets. They have these stunts and act. I mean, all this stuff is so amazing. 
amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you like musicals, you know, there's Bollywood. If you like sort of family melodramas, there's indie, uh, Korea. And it's like you don't have to stick with what's being given to you. You just turn your head yeah. slightly and this stuff's all there. That's kind of how I feel about these paperbacks. If people are saying, oh, horror books are in a rut or I don't mm-hmm. like what's out there right now or there was nothing good this year, dude, there are decades of yes. this stuff out yes. there. Most of it's a penny plus shipping on Amazon or just right. go to a swap shop and look for these things. There's, you You like gore? Dude, there are splatter punk people who will mm-hmm. curl your hair. You like zombies? Coming out the butt. You right. want something more subtle and slow? Charles L. Grant wrote like two yes. billion books. Like you just <laughs> yes. have to sort of look for this stuff and something you want is out there waiting. Absolutely. And, and you know, like Steve said, like I, I think there they're seeing a lot of these things almost for the first time. And because they're such a media oriented generation, they seem to prefer real things. So we were talking about like they prefer like like hardcover mm. books. Like a lot of people, you know, that come up at signings and stuff, they want the first edition printings of these things. Right. You know? Well and it's Which interesting. Is cool. Yeah, and it's also interesting to me, you know, right now distribution just isn't a problem with films, with books, with anything. Right. Like right. you want something, Amazon has it in your lap within minutes, mostly. Mm-hmm. And there's some hunting still to do, but mostly it's right there. The big problem is curation. There's so much access to so much. How do you know where to start or what's right. good or what's not or what's to your taste or what's not? Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, the huge challenge for horror, especially right now. Yes. Curation. Yes. You know, I, I really wish horror had more of a canon. Um, yes. I know that leaves some people out and that it's, it's contentious and all this, but I wish there were, you know, 40 books. I think people are trying to do it, but you can point out that these are the greats, you know? Exactly. Um, and and exactly. I, I like that it's flexible and it changes all the time, but I feel like sometimes, right, especially right now, People want someone to sort of point point them in the right direction. Right. Like if you want to be a horror writer, here are the books that you should be reading. Exactly. And I think I think Paperbacks from Hell is a good place to start. Oh, thanks. There's a lot of you know a lot of awesome stuff in there. Um, now I found uh, too. I I'm told that you um, that horror store is being optioned by Fox. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's not by Fox. It's um, a production company called Jackal Group, which Gail okay. Berman, who used to run Fox, and she did Buffy with uh, oh, gotcha. Josh Whedon okay. and everything. Okay. She's got it, and I actually just saw them in L.A. And I can't say where it is, but it looks like it's set up at a big, uh, not a network, but a big cable channel. And it looks like sometime in the next six months there will be an announcement. Awesome. No, it's really cool. <laughs> I can't believe it. news. Is that a horror show exclusive? That's a horror yeah. show exclusive. Okay. Um, and, and I sort of was holding out hope that it would be the first, like, hour drama on, like, QVC or HSN. But, <laughs> but it's not either That'd of those. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, because I think so much stuff is sort of unconventionally uh, produced, do you find that you have to try extra harder to do unconventional ways to promote it? Or does it make it easier because you can kind of go across these different platforms and different, like you could approach QVC for right. even just like a mention or something, yeah. you know what I mean? No, I really like doing this stuff. And like the reason I do the paperbacks from Hell show is I hate author appearances where people want you to read from the book. It's right. so boring. Right. Like I want to, I want to put butts in seats and people mm-hmm. have a good time. They left the house. They should be rewarded. Leaving the house is hard. Right. Um, right. And so, so I do the stuff that I find fun to do. I hate doing author appearances, the just reading thing and signing. Right. I just, right. I'd rather do a show. To me, that's fun. I'm scared of singing. So I've got songs in the show, you know, um, yes. the Summerland Lost show I do, you know, it's, a, it's, it's I it, it's a it's a really I'm doing it today and so I'm a little like distracted it's a lot to memorize but also mm-hmm. it's it's it is a show that's really really cathartic for me to do uh, it's a lot about death and dying and right. and it, it, it's it's a it's nothing but I do the stuff that's fun for me mm-hmm. uh, and I know that sounds really flip but I think that um, I went through a lot of my life feeling like there are things I should do to build my brand and build my right, career right. and do all this stuff. And I'm too old for people to tell me what I should be doing. I will be I will be dead at some point. Right. And, and so um, I really try to do stuff that I enjoy. And I'm extremely lucky that people have, have tolerated it. Um, right. Well, I think because it, because it's it's something interesting and exciting and interactive. Then you know it's more memorable. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, just even in, even in teaching, like students seem to you'd be more engaged if you're giving them something other than a lecture, right? You know, which so. I have to go do in a few minutes. <laughs> um, it's the first time I've ever taught. I'm terrified. Oh really? Oh yeah, in like oh, 15 just, minutes. I, was, I said you could picture them naked, but I'm not <laughs> so sure. That rather would, not. That would be any, <laughs> any comfort, really. Not but. not at Stoker. <laughs> do you have any questions, Steve? Anything you want to ask uh, Grady before we let him go? Uh, I think we covered a lot of it. Yeah. Um, 
just want to say thank you, like we said, for coming on. Absolutely. For, dude, thanks awesome. for having me. I love talking. Like, it's like my hobby. <laughs> so sure. Anytime people want to let me do it officially, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, should we ask about his suits? How do you how do you choose your suits for? Yes, <laughs> yes. How do right you now, choose your, because I, 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 you know, it, it takes a man of great confidence and bravery to wear a suit jacket that is not black. This is how I feel. <laughs> Although I'm doing black today, uh, <laughs> but that's because I'm doing Summerland Lost, and I either do an all white suit for that, or I do black and white like a Undertaker. Like an Undertaker, exactly. right? Right. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's it, I grew up wearing coats and ties, um, and like I hated them and rejected them. And there was a certain point where you sort of like realize that some of the stuff you grew up with wasn't all stupid. And right. and my mom was always used to be like, you know, it's not about you. It's about sort of showing respect for the places you are and the people you're talking to. Look nice. And I'm really my doing mom said that too. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm really doing this tie thing right now. I've gotten back into ties because I kind of like having like the insert of my own destruction around my neck. <laughs> Someone just grab this and hoist me up and kill me with it. If it doesn't like, go well, you always have an out. Right? Exactly. So it's kind of exciting. <laughs> Like, I could die at any minute with this. It's a fashion <laughs> accessory. It's a murder weapon. Um, Versatility's good. It's exactly. Good. And actually, I will say one of the big moments for me was um, uh, there's a big Hong Kong pop star named Andy Lau. And um, they used to have these Hong Kong pop stars who come through New York, and they'd all perform in Atlantic City. And they'd perform on, like, Thanksgiving. And they'd always start, or, like, Christmas, because those aren't Chinese holidays. And they would always start the show at midnight because everyone who had a job, all these Chinese people in New York, they were having to work, but this was a day off. And right. so they would take it until midnight to get out to Atlantic City. And so they were sort of hallucinatory. You're there from like midnight till four in the morning. And Andy Lau came out on, on stage at this show and it was, he was wearing this all pink suit. And I'm like, I won. <laughs> and, and it took me years to save for it. And I had a friend of mine actually make me a pink suit. And um, wow. it's so great. I used to have one made of fake tiger fur that was like a three piece suit, um, but I don't fit in that anymore. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for doing this. This was really awesome. Dude, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. This is great. Cool. All right. One more time. This week's show is brought to you by Victor Laval's Destroyer. Uh, we all know the story of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, how at the end of the novel, the monster escapes alive into the wilds of the Arctic. Well, now, in 2017, I know it's 2018, okay, but this was written in 2017, so... Play along Just with me here, folks. Close enough. 2017, the monster is still alive. Uh, it learns that there's one final descendant, a female scientist living in Montana, and thus the monster begins its journey toward her to finish its blood feud with the Frankenstein line. But that woman, Dr. Josephine Baker, the world's greatest expert in nanotechnology, has her own story. She's a mother of a teenage son who was recently killed by a member of the Chicago police. The cop saw a black boy and feared for his life. Josephine's son lost his. But Josephine has, much like her great old Uncle Victor, decided to defy the rules that defied the living and the dead. Using nanotechnology, she brings her murdered son to life. But what they don't realize is that the original creation is almost at their doorstep. What will happen when all three come face to face? Victor Laval's Destroyer is a mind-bending blend of horror and science fiction and family drama, combining Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with concerns ripped straight from current events. The Onions AV Club describes the book as thrilling, tragic, and topical. Illustrated with astounding beauty and flair, the book is now available as a trade paperback from Boom Studios, telling the entire six-issue story in one edition. This week's show is also brought to you by The Mud Man by Rob Herrera. On November 8th, 2016, a man of stone savagely attacked a quiet law office in rural New Jersey. Ten people were brutally mutilated, the killer was never caught, and the legend of the Franz Rock monster was born. The Mud Man is a fast-paced thriller laced with horror and dark humor, inspired by Frankenstein, folklore, and media freak shows the Mud Man explores what it means to be human, the transformative power of grief, and the fine lines between fact and fiction and man and monster. Some fathers will do anything for their daughters, even raise the dead. The Mud Man is born of mud and made for murder. The Mud Man by Rob Herrera is available in both paperback and digital, uh, excuse me, digital editions exclusively 
at Amazon.com. So we thank them both for sponsoring this week's show. A reminder, speaking of books, uh, we do the Horror Show Book Club. Coming up in May, we're going to be discussing A Dark Matter by Peter Straub. So uh, get on board now. Go buy A Dark Matter by Peter Straub. Paperback, hardcover, audiobook, ebook. It's available in all kinds of editions. Read it, and uh, then you can you can join us for our book discussion. We got a lot of complaints, Mary, and by a lot I mean one. Amber Fallon complained. Um, <laughs> I was hoping there would be more complaints. She complained. Oh, she can comp- well at Phoebe apparently. And I was sad I couldn't be here because I read the book. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Okay. Are you I gonna just, Are you gonna read a Dark Matter and join yeah. us for that one? Mm-hmm. All right. I just ordered two more Yvonne Navarro books. Yeah, apparently, nice. uh, Amber decided that Dave and I are not allowed to do book clubs by ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, so you, you you both will have to join us for a Dark Matter. I uh, also want to remind you. Speaking of Mary and and, and joining us, uh, Mary's podcast, Cosmic Shenanigans. Uh, airs every week wherever you're listening to the horror show. You can also listen to Cosmic Shenanigans. Um, and Dave, we talked about it earlier, but yeah, tune in and watch him live stream at twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. Uh, to advertise on the horror show, send an email to Dave, meteornotes at gmail.com. And as always, if there's something you want to talk to us about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website, the horror show with BrianKeen.com. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Next week, we were going to have Keith Giffen. Mary and I were going to have lunch with him Sunday and do an interview, but but Keith has to go to a convention in Washington, D.C., and he wanted me to go to that with him, but Mary won't let me, and apparently I have to go have Easter dinner with her family instead. So, uh, yes. speaking of Easter, <laughs> I don't know what we'll have next week. Maybe Dave has something here well, for us. Well, I, I, since Phoebe's here, we should talk about what we're going to do on Easter because, uh, you know, Easter's a very important holiday in, in my life, being religious as I am. So, uh, <laughs> you're for, a veritable monk, yes, Dave. Yes, yes. So, <sighs> for, for Easter, <laughs> Easter, uh, Phoebe and I are attending the Suicide Girls Burlesque Show. Woohoo! It's, uh, yeah, that was her idea too. So. You know, it was a birthday gift. Yes, it was a birthday so that's, gift, that's, and we didn't realize it was Easter Sunday. <laughs> like, I think it's, I think that's bad. Is that like a sin somewhere? Right, right, right. somewhere. That's, 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 <laughs> so, so take along the portable and interview some Suicide Girls, and we can have them next week. I don't, I don't. We didn't pay for the VIP. Yeah, we didn't pay for the VIP. <laughs> Because like, she gives me the tickets. It's like a milestone birthday. She, well, 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 she gives me the tickets. She goes, I didn't, I didn't spring the VIP. I go, I'm pretty sure the suicide girls don't want to meet 250 years. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> now, I've, now, I know several suicide girls. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, in fact, Tiffany Scandal used to be a suicide girl. Mm-hmm. So here's what I propose, Mary. As much as I love these big holiday dinners at your parents' home, Tread carefully. With, with yeah, 50, yeah. 60 aunts and uncles who still can't remember my name after almost a decade, Dave. Yeah, that's always uh, fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe you you go to the dinner. I call Tiffany and, and use her contacts to get me a VIP pass. And I take the portable recorder backstage at the Suicide Girls Burlesque Show and get us an interview for next week. How about no? She's being very kind. Just stop. All right. Well, we'll find <laughs> You're a smart out. Smart man, Brian. <laughs> we'll tune in next week to find out what happens, folks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I'm Donald Bump, and I'm one of, if not the greatest character on the Curtain Jerkers Project Entertainment Network's Pro Wrestling Podcast. Every Friday, Token Tom Clock, Steve Mesa, and the Viking Superkick Pro Wrestling in the high spot. Featuring interviews with the up-and-coming indie superstars. They're not better than me. They never will be. They want to be, but they can't. They're the stable that shoots while it works. And you can only hit them right here on the Project Entertainment Network. Thank you very much. And let's make wrestling great again.